One of the highlights of my overseas visits was my visit to Iran. The longest time prophecy of the Bible had its origin here. May God speak to your heart as you listen to God's plan to cleanse you, not only from your sins, but also from the record of your past sins. During our last lecture, we heard about the good news of the judgment. Both the judge, God the Father, as well as the advocate, Jesus Christ, are biased toward the acquittal of the repenting sinner. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is present in this court case. The judge does not excuse the sins of the accused. But when it is found that the sinner confessed his sins and made Christ his only hope, something marvelous happens. Jesus stands before the accused, condemned, hell-deserving sinner. Father, he says, I have died for him and have paid the penalty for his sins. He has accepted my offer of forgiveness. Pronounce him innocent. And the Father sees Jesus instead of the sinner. This is the good news concerning the judgment. In chapter 8 we have even more good news. God is going to destroy the record of our confessed sins. Not a trace of it will be found in the hereafter. No one will spend eternity as a forgiven criminal. No, we will be treated as though we have never sinned. I'm looking forward to that glorious day. Isaiah 65 verse 17 Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. You will not remember any hurt you have caused or experienced. Angels will not remember your sinful past. But best of all, God will not remember your past. We are getting a brand new start. Daniel tells of a ram and a he-goat he saw next to the Ulai River at Susa. Then the vision changes from visual to auditory, from seeing to hearing. Daniel 8, 13 and 14 Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said to me, for two thousand and three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now in order to understand the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, we first have to study the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. In the Old Testament times, a repentant sinner brought a lamb to the sanctuary, placed both hands on the lamb and confessed his sins. After cutting the lamb's throat, the blood was taken into the sanctuary where the priest applied it to the horns of the altar. Tell me, what happened to the guilt of the sinner? Well, it was symbolically transferred to the sanctuary. How was the defiled sanctuary to be cleansed? On no other day was the gospel so fully proclaimed as on the day of atonement when the sanctuary was cleansed. Lots were cast on two goats that were brought to the tabernacle. One was called the Lord's goat and the other Asasel, the devil. Let me first explain something about the most holy that was separated by a veil from the holy. Two angels made of gold looked reverently onto the Ark of the Covenant. God's holy law was placed inside the chest that was covered by a lid called the kaporet in Hebrew meaning to wipe out and hilasterenion in Greek, which means reconciliation. The King James Version calls it the mercy seat, and the NIV the cover of atonement. God's glory was displayed above the cover. Keep in mind, while we follow the high priest into the most holy place, the cleansing of the record of sins that took place on this day was a type of the antitypical cleansing of the record of sins in the heavenly sanctuary which began in 1844, as we shall see. Leviticus 16.13 He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony, so that he will not die. And then he had to do something very significant with the blood. Verse 15 He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover. 
Why? Because God's law had been transgressed. But God had provided a place where sin could be forgiven and that was in his very presence. The moment the blood touched the mercy seat, the record of sins was symbolically wiped out. A reconciliation was effected. Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary can only be understood in the light of what happened on the great day of atonement in the earthly sanctuary. This is a message of unbelievable hope which says that the record of our sins will soon be completely blotted out. Christ is going to press delete on heaven's computer and the record of our sins will be gone forever. Hebrews 9 verse 23 says, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Are you with me? When a sinner brought his sacrifice to the earthly sanctuary, he received forgiveness. But the priest took the blood of the Lamb, which represented the record of his confessed sins, into the sanctuary. And then, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the sanctuary was cleansed of the record of all these confessed sins. Leviticus 16 verse 16 In this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of the uncleanness. But there was some more good news for the repentant sinner on the day of atonement. God was not only willing to work for them, he also wanted to do a work in them. Leviticus 16 verse 30 For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you. That you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. What a thought! I must keep on repeating this good news. On the day of atonement the Israelites were not only cleansed from all their sins. On that day the record of their sins was removed from the sanctuary. They stood before God as if they had never sinned. And this is the nature of the work of judgment and cleansing with which Jesus began in 1844, as we shall see a little later. When his great high priestly work in the most holy place is completed, you and I will stand before God and his holy law as if we had never sinned. But the Day of Atonement was also a day of judgment. Leviticus 23.29 says, Anyone who does not deny himself on that day must be cut off from his people. The King James Version says, Afflict. It was a day of serious heart-searching and fasting. The word cut off implies the seriousness of the Day of Atonement as a day of judgment. Verse 30 says, I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. They are to keep the day as they would keep the Sabbath. Farrer in his book, The Early Days of Christianity, page 238, writes, So awful was the Day of Atonement that we are told in a Jewish book of ritual that the very angels run to and fro in fear and trembling, saying, Lo, the day of judgment has come. Tell me, if the heavenly sanctuary is being cleansed right now, what kind of lives should we be living? I think it should be lives of self-denial. It is imperative that our repentance deepens continually. It usually happens when we look at the sinless life of Jesus. And we must always remember that God only handles confessed sins in the heavenly sanctuary. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all sins. One of the most difficult things in life is to say, I'm sorry. Ask God anyway for strength to do it. You will experience a peace that comes directly from above. Isaiah 1 18 Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. 
The vision we have in chapter 9 of Daniel is an explanation of the vision of the 2,300 days of chapter 8. To my mind, this is one of the most Christ-centered chapters in the Old Testament. Chapter 9 begins with a prayer. Listen to verse 18. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Daniel was still on his knees when Gabriel came down and explained to him the meaning of the vision of the 2,300 days. Daniel 9, 21, 22 While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Verse 23 As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore consider the message and understand the vision. We've discovered previously in Ezekiel 4, verse 6 and Numbers 14, 34 that one day in a prophetic context stands for one year. Listen how Jesus urges us to study the book of Daniel. Matthew 24, verse 15 So when you see the desolating sacrilege spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. The first 490 years of the 2,300 year prophecy only deals with God's people, the Jews, as well as their city, Jerusalem. Let's read this amazing prophecy. Daniel 9.24 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. What is the meaning of the word decreed or cut off? The Hebrew word Katak means to amputate. Daniel says that not only would 490 years be cut off from the 2,300 years, but that the Jews as a nation would be cut off prophetically. So all New Testament prophecies concerning Israel must be applied to spiritual Israel, the New Testament church. Does Daniel give us a clue when this amazing prophecy would begin? Yes. It's amazing. Let's read it. Daniel 9.25 Know and understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. When was such a decree issued? I was so excited when I visited the tomb of Artaxerxes at Naqshi i Rustam in Iran. He was the Persian king who passed a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. According to Ezra chapter 7, Artaxerxes in his seventh regnal year sent the Jewish scribe Ezra back to Jerusalem. He granted him extensive privileges to reorganize Judah's judicial and administrative structure as a Jewish state within the Persian Empire in perfect harmony with the laws of Moses. As I looked at the gifts that were brought to the Persian king, I thought of Artaxerxes' generosity to the Jews. He made the journey back to Jerusalem a financial possibility. The exact date of the decree is 457 BC. Now this is according to the Jewish civil year which runs six months later than the Persian calendar. Now that we've established the beginning of the 2,300 year prophecy, we can start exploring this inspiring Christ-centered prophecy. Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The total is sixty-nine weeks or 483 days, which equals years. This prophecy tells us that the first seven weeks or 49 years would be devoted to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. You can read about this interesting time in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. After the first seven weeks or 49 years, there follows another 62 weeks or 434 years. This is exciting because it is so Christ-centered. This prophecy predicts Christ's first coming to the earth. Let's read it again. 
Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Gabriel brings exciting news. After 49 years plus 434 years, a total of 483 years, could this world expect the coming of the Messiah? What a revelation! When you add 483 years to 457 BC, you arrive at the year 27 AD. Are you still with me? This is a very important messianic prophecy. We cannot afford to lose one another in our search for the date of the first coming of Christ to this planet. What happened in the history of our world on this important date? Let's explore some more Bible verses. Verse 24 tells us about Christ's incredible mission. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness. This gives us the broad picture that the Messiah was coming to earth to settle the sin problem and to reconcile us to God. Matthew 3.16 tells us what happened in 27 AD at the conclusion of the 483-year prophecy. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Jesus is officially anointed as the Messiah. Tiberias, a city in Israel, is named after Emperor Tiberius. Dr. Luke refers to the time when Jesus was baptized and says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened. Luke 3 verse 1 The fifteenth year of Tiberius Caesar was exactly 27 AD. Jesus was baptized on time. Mark 1, 14 and 15 has this to say concerning the year 27 AD. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. To what time is he referring? Well, he's referring to the fulfillment of the time prophecy of Daniel 9.25. What an amazing revelation. Galatians 4 verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son. Which time is this? This is the prophetic time of Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. When God's great prophetic clock struck in 27 AD, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. Peter explains the relationship between the anointing of Jesus as Messiah and his baptism in the Jordan. Acts chapter 10, 37 and 38. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He was anointed as Messiah at his baptism. After his baptism, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled. What time? The prophetic time of Daniel 8 and 9. The fulfillment of the last seven years of this prophecy is amazing. Let's read what would happen from 27 to 34 AD. Daniel 9.27 Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. There is one prophetic week or seven literal years left in the prophecy. What is half of seven? Three and a half. Three and a half years from the fall of 27 AD leads us to the spring of 31 AD. Daniel predicts that Jesus would terminate the sacrificial system in 31 AD. 
In other words, a time would come when people would no longer be required to bring a sacrificial animal to die in their stead. How would Jesus accomplish it? Daniel tells us. Verse 26. The anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. What a unique description of the death of Christ. In order to make an end to the sacrificial lamb, Jesus had to become the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Exactly three and a half years after Jesus was baptized, this prophecy was fulfilled when he died on the cross of Calvary. Isaiah 53 verse 5 He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is the good news of Daniel 9 verse 27. A lamb has been provided for your sins and mine. Christ was crucified exactly on time, not a minute too soon, nor a minute too late. I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us from the accursed load. I bring my guilt to Jesus to wash my crimson stains, white in his blood most precious, till not a stain remains. After the Jews crucified Christ, God's grace lingered another three and a half years. According to the prophecies of Daniel, God's covenant with the Jews would cease in 34 AD. Stephen was the last prophet that appealed to the Jewish leadership to accept Jesus as the Messiah at the termination of the 490-year prophecy. Every time I visit St. Stephen's Gate at Jerusalem, I think of the stoning of this man of God. When he died, the prophecy of Daniel 9.25 was fulfilled, which said, Seal up the vision and the prophecy. I was amazed at the many times Jesus quoted from the prophecy of Daniel 9. One such time was during his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Let's read it. Luke 19, 41 to 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what should bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What were the consequences of their rejection of Jesus? Matthew 23 verse 38 Luke, your house is left to you desolate. In the first place, Jesus was referring to the year 34 AD when the 490 year prophecy concerning the Jews as God's chosen people would end. In the second place, he was referring to the destruction of the city which took place in 70 AD. Archaeologists excavated this burnt house in Jerusalem that proves the destruction by Titus in that very same year. Tell me, how long will strife and war continue in earthly Jerusalem? Do you think that peace would return to the place where Arabs, Jews and Christians live together? Daniel 9.27 says this about Jerusalem. War will continue until the end. May I invite my Arab and Jewish friends and all those who hope for peace on an earthly Jerusalem to look for another Jerusalem. Revelation 21 verse 2 And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. How can you and I become citizens of the new Jerusalem? What must we do to belong to a painless, tearless, problem-free and deathless society? Galatians 3.29 gives the answer. 
If you belong to Christ, then you are Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. What a thought. If I belong to Jesus, I'm going to inherit everything that God has promised ancient Israel, including everlasting life. Galatians 6, 15 and 16. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. And then Paul greets all those who had the experience of the new creation, this new birth. He says, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. The 2300 year prophecy which began in 457 BC ended in 1844 AD. What happened at that time? The investigative judgment and the cleansing of the sanctuary began. Before we do a final summary of this Christ-centered message of chapter 7, 8 and 9 of Daniel, I must just mention one important aspect. Orientals reason from effect to cause, not like the Western mind which reasons from cause to effect. We find this in the prophecies of Daniel 7, 8 and 9. At the conclusion of the investigative judgment in chapter 7, Jesus is portrayed as king. What are the causes that led to this exalted position? How could he become our righteous king? Because chapter 8 refers to Christ as our sympathetic, understanding high priest, he not only cleanses the record of our sins, he also cleanses our hearts from sin. What qualified Jesus to become the high priest and advocate on our behalf in chapter 8? Chapter 9 says he became the Lamb of God who died in our stead on the cross of Calvary. What a beautiful sequence. Before Jesus could become the king, he had to be a priest. Before he became a priest, he had to have something to offer. And on Calvary, he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Have you heard the term package deal? In Jesus you get a lamb, a spotless lamb that you can offer to God the Father for sins committed. In Jesus you have a high priest who pleads your case every time you slip and fall. In Jesus you also have a king who is coming soon to take repentant sinners home. As a fallen sinner I want to accept this package deal that the Father offers me right now. What about you? I am certain that the book of Daniel gave you a new appreciation of Christ the Lamb, the High Priest and our coming King. May I invite you to a fascinating study from the book of Revelation. Our next lecture will cover the intriguing description of the seven seals of Revelation. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we stand guilty before you. We have transgressed your holy law and are sinners. But you have paid the penalty and you have suffered and died in our place so that we can receive everlasting life. Thank you for such unselfish love. In Jesus' name, Amen.